and I'll share the screen. It'll take me a second. Um, go ahead and ask your question. Um, well, I mean, I was going, isn't there going to be a presentation? Um, the, there was at the earlier home fair last week. So the concept today is it's more of a question and answer. Oh, and okay. I'm here and uh, Mike Chin is with the uh, Seattle Office of Civil Rights. So we should okay. be able to. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't have any questions right offhand. I was going to listen for a while and see if anyone else did and then maybe chime in. Okay. All right. Um, I w we might just be qu quiet if, if and looking at our have, phones. Yeah. If you do have a question, it, um, it'd be great if you want to type it into the chat box so we can monitor it and that way everybody can see it. And then we'll be reading the uh, question out loud so everyone can hear and Alec or Mike will be able to answer it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And and actually, what I think would be helpful is maybe um, at one o'clock when we get a few extra folks joining us, um, maybe just do a quick introduction, um, Alex, yes. and then myself, and then maybe just a quick overview of kind of um, uh, Alex, if you can just ex explain what you enforce, the laws that you enforce, and your role, and then I can also do the same thing on um, um, Office for Civil Rights. So that'll help kind of field the type of questions that we might be getting. It might be directed either to you, Alex, or to myself. And of, co of course, um, mm -hmm. you know, so we can just kind of maybe do quick introductions. I think that's great. Also, I don't know if it'll work with chat, like something that uh, we had discussed was putting links in the chat, but I, I don't know if the chat is going through super fast because I noticed that we have a new renting in Seattle um, handbook. So that might be something that uh, Ms. Calavan would appreciate having a chance to look at. I don't know. Oh, great. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I mean, I could go to the website and download it. I can um, certainly drop uh, drop the link in the chat box right now for, oh, okay. for you to look at. Great. And for whoever joins us, they, they can have um, browse it. So okay. hold on for a moment. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, you know how to um, titles by our name on WebEx? Um, I've never even attempted that. That's a good question. Yeah, let's see. I could, I'm, uh, I'm just... My thing right now is I'm, I have, um, my screen is down to like two by two. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, might be a little harder. Yeah. Let's see, I can go here. Probably not the best time for me to mess with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me redo that. Mm. Okay, so it's one o'clock and uh, it looks like we've got at least a couple guests in here. Um, my name is Alec McCune. I'm a code compliance analyst at the city of Seattle in um, the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspection. I'm a code analyst and the, uh, the areas that I enforce are around landlord tenant rules and um, such as prohibited acts, um, cause eviction, uh, rental agreement regulation, are some, and tenant relocation ordinance are some of the main areas. Um, this is being recorded. There's a transcript that'll be created out of this and it'll be accessible uh, going forward at a, a Seattle Home Fairs link. So I want to um, go ahead and turn it over to my colleague. Um, well, I have two colleagues here. Um, Hua Mai is sort of moderating things and we might not hear a ton from her. Um, and my other colleague, Mike Chin, I'll let him introduce himself now. Great, thanks Alex. And good afternoon everyone. My name is Michael Chin and I am from the Seattle Office for Civil Rights. And um, I, our Office of Civil Rights enforces the fair housing laws, including fair chance housing and other non-discrimination laws that are, that are specific to the city of Seattle. 
So um, I'm excited to be part of this panel and to answer questions that folks have. Um, please go ahead and put it into the chat or you can go ahead and verbally share that. I think if that's a possibility as well, I'm not sure. If we don't get overwhelmed if I with people. Okay. And for those of you um, that just, uh, Yvonne, I see Yvonne and Brent uh, are here. Um, this is not a formal presentation. This is a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, there won't be any presentation if, if that's what you're waiting for. So just um, to let you know. Great. And I went to the website that you noted. Is there a, I don't find a link to that new um, resource that you mentioned. Oh, the, the renter's handbook? Yes. Me... I'm just about to put that in the chat right now. Oh, great. Um, so okay. the handbook great. will be um, coming shortly. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. of our guests who are here right now you know if you have renters or um you know this is really the place uh to bring some questions about how to handle um you know situations um maybe around um whether you're bringing a new tenant in some of the rules and regulations around that um you know the life of the tenancy and the conclusion of the tenancy I think when we do get a question, we're going to really spend some time talking. <laughs> um, and our oh. hi, Randy and Brian here. Um, have a question around um, the eviction moratorium. Um, and okay. kind of what that means for uh, landlords um, when that moratorium ends. Question. Great question. I definitely have some things to say about that. Um, Mike, will you want to weigh in on that or should I just assume I should go on that? Okay, so yeah. um, with the moratorium, we are unable to predict if it will be extended or not. Okay, so as it currently stands, there's two. There's the mayor and city council have their moratorium, which is at the city level, affects all city properties uh, in rental. And then there's the governor's moratorium. The, the mayor's is more restrictive, but they're both set to expire on March 31st. We, all, we also know that they've been extended multiple times, so you can sort of gauge whether we're coming out of the emergency or not, as well as any of us can. So when we come out of that, um, there's going to be a requirement to, so say you have a tenant that's in non-payment of rent, you'll need to, if they have been unable to pay rent as a result of COVID-19, then you'll need to be um, aware that they have some uh, right to attempt a payment plan. So that's kind of the concept. So you need to, it's going to be a little complicated. Um, offer them a payment plan. And your 14 day notice, the 14 day notice will need to have some required language in it that says um, that non payment due to COVID can be a defense. So it's going to be a tricky time if you've got a buildup of unpaid rent. Um, and I can sort of go to that um, thing. Is that is that helping you right now? I mean, is that matching a situation that you have or? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my husband is about becoming landlords. And so we're kind of just navigating what current situation is and then um, 
you know, kind of preparing for various outcomes in the future? Yeah, so um, this will take me a second. I, I should probably been quite a few things for this, but then not everything. And um, let's start with, I'm having a little trouble with uh, being able to do use my tabs right now. Okay, so if you bring an in right now, that you know they would not be and they went into non payment with a brief period while the moratorium is in effect. So, you know, I don't know what the concerns would be if you were ready to start a tenancy right now, you know, and the tenant looks like they're qualified and they can make the payments. You know, I don't know if you would have as many concerns. We've been hearing a lot from owners where tenants have been unable to pay, and that's maybe more of what I'm addressing. So, uh, what are your main concerns right now? It was it was more kind of around <laughs> what the landlords are currently doing now to navigate through that the situation, and then, um, you know, are they they're they're you answered the question with the payment plan. That was one thing I was curious about is, um, are they ultimately responsible for back pay? Um, and oh, yes. you know, what, what if, you know, what are, what are the elements of kind of recourse? Do you go to small claims court or you know, how do you, how do you actually get um, back rent? Um, so traditionally, I mean, I, you know, this is maybe beyond what the department does, but generally when people do an eviction action, um, <clears throat> the tenant is evicted, there will be a judgment that comes from that. And and they, uh, if, so say you did need to terminate a tenancy and the tenant was unable to move and you ultimately had to take them to a hearing. Uh, the hearing there will a judgment will usually be made that describes the amount of liability and then I, I i don't know exactly what happens with the judgment but i you know i don't know a lot about collection or whatever but um you know there's a lot of it just depends on the a lot of times too if it's someone that's going to get an, another job soon they'll be able to make payments that's that's a factor um you know, another thing to consider um, is Section 8 has been a wonderful for owners during this period because people that are on Section 8 have not stopped making payments. It's it's maybe a little counterintuitive, but um, Section 8 makes that payment every month. And if the tenant has an income, if they have a breakdown in their income, Section 8 will recalculate their share. So. Um, people that were open to having Section 8 tenants have been getting paid this whole time. I, I think, you know, I think you're not supposed to, Mike might be able to speak to that with Section 8 tenants. You're, you know, if you open your property up to, you know, um, advertise it in public, I think you have to take the first qualified tenant and you're not supposed, to, yeah, you could answer, you could break in on that, right, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, no, you're doing a great yeah. job. Um, so you're absolutely right, is that uh, housing choice vouchers, otherwise known as Section 8 and other housing subsidies is a, are protected classes in the city of Seattle. And these, and actually statewide as well, um, housing choice vouchers is also a statewide protection. Um, it's not on the federal level, but it definitely has been a run on the books for probably about 30, 40 years now, since the 1970s. That is a protected class. So you cannot, as a housing provider, discriminate against a housing provider based on having a housing choice voucher. And what Alex was also talking about was new legislation that passed a couple of years ago called uh, First in Time. And basically that law uh, requires that um, housing providers put up, um, provide um, in their advertising uh, what the minimum qualifications for that housing be. So for example, how can say you must uh, have an income of uh, three times the rent 
or any of those sort of minimum qualifications. You have to provide that in advertising. And once you get an applicant um, who meets those criteria, then you have to take that first um, applicant before considering the second applicant. And so that is a very unique law to uh, City of Seattle. It is enforced by the Office for Civil Rights. And it just ensures that um, whoever's first in line should have the first opportunity um, or first right of refusal. Um, so the refusal part is not on the landlord's is more on the applicant who's seeking housing. Now, then again, I just wanna just reiterate that they have to meet the minimum qualifications. So, and they have to complete the, the application. So if they submitted an incomplete application or they don't meet the minimum qualifications, it does not require housing providers to accept the first person who, um, who applies for that particular unit. So that kind of gives some sort of a nutshell on that. Um, hopefully that's helpful. And it may also um, bring in other questions for folks. That is really helpful. Thank you. Actually, if you don't mind, what I might do, since um, I know there are some questions around the eviction moratorium, um, I actually would like to share some information um, with regards to some other protections that were passed last year um, that actually um, provides protections for people who have um, eviction records or who were rejected um, during the time of COVID. And so I think it's kind of maybe if I can just do a quick summary of that, would that be okay, Alex? That would be great. Okay, yep. And so it's actually a new law that was passed last year. And so what it did was it amended our, uh, our fair chance housing and expanded it to also provide other protections, especially during uh, this period of time of COVID. And basically in summary, this law basically says that housing providers cannot take any sort of adverse action against a tenant or potential tenant, such as rejecting a potential tenant based on their COVID-19 related eviction history. So just remember that these are eviction records that might connect, be connected to a COVID-19 related eviction history. So if you have an applicant who was evicted during COVID period of time, and of course it would be during this entire period of time of the civil emergency proclaimed by Mayor Durkin on March 3rd until current. And I think um, Alex said that it's supposed to um, expire, I think March 31st, it may get extended. Um, and six months after the emergency is declared over. So any of those records that might pertain to a COVID-19 related eviction history, as a housing provider, you should be aware that you cannot deny someone or take some sort of adverse action, not consider their application, not um, during if, the, if there was a COVID-19 related eviction history. And so we have not received any of these cases because the civil emergency still continues um, up to March 31st and actually may, may be extended beyond that period of time. There are a few exceptions to these new protections. And like I said, it's only of time during the civil emergency that um, issued by American. One of the exceptions is Unlo any sort of unlawful detainer action or actions or on a termination notice is due to actions by the tenant constituent, uh, uh, constituting an em eminent threat to health or safety of neighbors or landlord. So for example, if someone was just being a poor tenant or they were causing some sort of threat to persons or property on the unit, that could be a reason to evict someone um, if uh, those records could be seen to um, be able to be reason that a future uh, uh, landlord could say, no, we're not going to rent to you. The second exception is any federally assisted housing where there is an exclusion for adverse actions when denial of tenancy is required by federal regulations. And so it's very similar to kind of like, you know, federal law, of course, is kind of on the hierarchy over state law and state law has a hierarchy over city law, but there is, a, but when it pertains to federal assisted housing, they can actually determine um, what sort of, um, they have their own set of regulations that housing providers and applic or and tenants have to follow. A lot of this information is available on our website at seattle.gov um, forward slash civil rights. 
Um, so any of this information, as well as you can also contact us at um, our, our office number 206-684-4500 or discriminationquestions at seattle.gov. So that kind of ties into some of the questions that might have expanded or maybe brought in some additional questions that folks may have during this eviction moratorium. I do have one add-in um, uh, to the new perspective, um, but Hua, do we have any questions that are coming through on the chat? And people are welcome to sort of put questions into chat because um, um, you know we get on our on track, we can start talking for a few minutes. So please don't hesitate to put questions in the chat. Do we have anything, Hua? Or no, so far we don't have anything in the chat um, questions wise, but I have dropped a bunch of links there if anybody is interested. I just dropped a um, link for Office of Civil Rights there for your reference. So I, I did want to add to the new perspective owners that there is also something called, uh, it's, we, we colloquially call it RIO at the city and it's for the acronym R. R I O. So once you get going, you do need to register the property with the city and the city has a program and I'm not the best person on this, but I'm, I'm aware of it. And it is, um, there's kind of a checklist of just ensuring that the property meets um, certain standards of um, habitability. And you, you do, it is, a and Hua might actually know more about this than I do. I think it's maybe a yearly fee, uh, um, you know, a, a sort of an administrative fee. It's not, I don't think it's too, too much. Um, and then they will do a spot inspection on a, the idea is that they'll get around to inspecting a property once every five years or so, just to make sure that it's meeting some basic, um, you know, habitability requirements. So that's another thing. Um, and you do need to register for that. So just keep that in mind also. Hey, um, this question might be for Mike here um, in the chat. It says, is first in time still in effect? I think you just mentioned it. Yeah, um, I did see that question because I wasn't sure if it was, if that question came up before or after I was speaking. So my apologies for not catching that. So yes, first in time is still effective is still in effect even during the emergency civil um, emergency orders currently um, all of the all of the laws um, all of the regulations that SDCI enforces as well as OCR enforces um, my understanding I, and I shouldn't speak on behalf of Alex but I know that for civil rights laws they are all in effect um, there is no sort of um, a pause on any of those laws um, so just to be aware that if you have other questions about first in time, Feel free to share them. I know sometimes it can be a little bit, um, a little bit complicated um, around um, person time, and I'm happy to answer any questions or scenarios that you may want to share. Um, I do want to refer back to something that Alex mentioned: is that um, since some of the um, audience members may be in um, single-family homes, uh, single-family dwellings, and they have an accessory dwelling unit or a detached accessory dwelling unit. Um, which um, Office of Civil Rights is not in force. Um, but from experience, all accessory dwelling units also have to be registered by uh, register with Rio. And so that is one thing to consider. Um, one of the things that Alex did point out very, very, um, very well is that um, Rio does require for all accessory dwelling units that you're looking out or detached accessory, uh, detached accessory dwelling units as well. But we do encourage you to, um, there's some great resources on the um, sale.gov Rio site. I don't know what the link is, um, but it'll give you some information about how to register and what are some of the minimum requirements that your unit has to pass in order to, um, to, um, to be licensed um, with Rio. Yeah, I just sent a link to Hua uh, with the with the Rio landing page on it um, in the, by email. I don't know if anyone's you know looking at that. 
Um, anyone, um, you know, we were encouraging people to type questions in, but if our if our group is small enough too, and you want to unmute yourself, you can ask a question too, at least for now. Um, it, and uh, we are recording this, but you know, all we're talking about is housing things. So we would welcome anyone um, if it would be easier to size your question than type it out. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Hey, Alex, um, even though I'm a panel member, um, I have a question for you and I will also answer it the same way. Um, what are th some of the 10 top questions that you um, that you get re that you receive from either new landlords or current landlords around the laws that you enforce? Like maybe five. You can just say five if you can't think of all 10. And I can go first. I can tell you guys what the five or 10 top questions that come up to OCR to give you some time to think about that. Um, yeah, uh, how about if you start uh, with a couple and then I'll see if I can uh, conjure up a couple. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I think, um, and I'll just tell you, I have been, um, I have been doing fair housing enforcement since 2007 for, um, and so I've seen all types of questions that have come through our office over the years. I think that the most common question that we receive is around service animals um, and reasonable accommodation. Those are probably the most common questions that we have um, that come up a lot. And this is something where we do a lot of, um, provide technical assistance to housing providers to be able to answer some of those questions about what the law requires. And so for those of you who are not familiar with service animals, service animals is a kind of a legal term of art, um, but it is a protected um, activity um, under both the Federal Fair Housing Act, the Washington Law Against Discrimination, and the Seattle Municipal Code. If a person with a disability has a disability-related need for a service animal, and a service animal is much broader than, um, than the state definition of service animal. It can be an emotional support animal. Um, it could be a, an animal that provides an actual service. So for example, if someone um, needed a, um, um, a, you know, a seeing eye dog, that could be an actual specific service to be trained to do a certain service. Um, those, um, it could be emotional support, a comfort animal, seizure dog, any type of animal, and it does not have to be a dog. It can also be a cat. It could be any other types of animal, domesticated animal. Uh, those are all types of service animal city of under the federal and state law. If a person has a disability related need for a service animal, a person will then just say, hey, um, uh, they may have to be provide documentation. Um, if it's not really apparent, the person has a disability and has a disability related need for the animal. But you do have a responsibility to engage in that interactive process to be able to provide a solution, provide the accommodation if it's reasonable in the um, in the terms of, and and just remember it's a case by case basis. So that's a common question that we always get. Another question sometimes we, we always get is around first in time. So first in time, even though that was a question that Amy Wu brought up a little bit earlier in the chat, um, we get a lot of questions around first in time. And like I gave a quick summary, is that requires housing providers to consider the first qualified applicant and offer the unit to them before considering the second person. Um, a third question that usually comes up, um, and these are newer legislation, um, is around fair chance housing. So if for those who may not be familiar with fair chance housing, that is a law that is really unique to Seattle, but there's a couple of other jurisdictions that have fair chance housing protections. Um, that is um, That law basically is separate from the fair housing law, so um, the Seattle Open Housing Ordinance, but it's a separate law that requires housing providers, um, prohibits housing providers, I should say, from screening, uh, from screening, taking adverse action or anything of the above to um, reject or, re, re, or, um, or require 
an applicant or a tenant to be screened for criminal history. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. One exception is if um, the housing provider or the, um, the landlord um, wants to take a look at the sex offender registry. But just be aware that if a housing provider looks at the sex offender registry of a potential applicant, they can only, they have to do another analysis before they deny them. They have to make sure that that person is not, um, that that act that they can, you know, that they had committed and were convicted of um, would not uh, at all impact their housing. So they also have to look at other factors, for example, how long ago the, uh, the conviction occurred, the circumstances that it occurred, the age of the individual when it occurred, four or five different factors um, for that. So you can't just automatically deny someone because they are on the sex offender registry. You have to do an additional analysis on that. Another exception, uh, exemption would be if it's a federally funded type um, property, um, those in that situation, they would not, um, federal laws would, uh, would, um, would, would basically trump the fair chance housing laws um, if it's federally assisted housing in a, a project-based type um, housing choice voucher. So those are the three that, that come to mind right now. Alex, do you another question here, but Alex, do you have anything? Well, I, I would be happy to hear the question. I've got a, I've, I wrote out a couple things so I could easily um, circle back to that if we want to hear a question. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So the question that I see is in a duplex house, if owner occupies one unit and the first in time is still true for the other unit. Oh, so that's a question for me. Um, that's a great question. So duplex houses or triplex or fourplex um, or are all considered multifamily properties. Um, they are not considered single family dwelling. So if it is a duplex house where the owner lives, um, owns and lives in that unit and is renting out a second unit, the next one next door in a duplex setting, they still are responsible. They're still required to follow uh, uh, first in time and fair chance housing laws, as well as all the other um, fair housing laws um, as well. But that's a great question. I know that has come up to our office before in the past. Um, okay, yeah, I wanted to jump in on that um, because uh, the, the, the duplex is, um, can create quite an interesting situation and, um, Anyone that's in here that's listening to this would really benefit from understanding this. Um, a duplex is sometimes is a zoning description, okay? And so if you have a single family home and you've got an a ADU, is that a duplex? And it's a zoning question as far as I understand. Now, I'm not quite an expert on this, but I know when it when when it can get into a position where I'm not able to answer that, we will actually send that out as a research question sometimes and say, is this property a single family home that has an ADU or is it a duplex? And I think, um, you know, um, Mike was suggesting talking about some of the questions we get from owners. And that is a big question. Um, you know, when can I use a just cause notice to terminate a tenancy? Um, and if you have, say you want to sell a home and we're not, this is presumes that we're not under the moratorium. Okay. So that's, keep that in mind. Um, that's not a valid notice right now under the moratorium. Um, but, you know, we, we're all hoping to be out of that scenario soon. And if you do need to sell a home, can you use a just cause to terminate a tenancy so that you have a cleared house? Well, if it's an ADU, the answer is probably yes. You can use a 20-day notice in an ADU um, if it's owner-occupied. So if you're owner-occupied on the main level and then you have someone in another 
attached part of the house, then yes. But if you're not owner occupied, then no. And then, it, and then furthermore, if it's a duplex, you cannot use the single family as a reason to terminate. Buried in what I just said is is an assumption that the house that you're selling is a single family home in order to use the sale of homes. The idea being that someone, well, I don't know what the concept is. I'm just assuming that when the rules are written and you're selling a duplex, the idea of having renters in the duplex is 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 a reason to sell the place. It's it's a it's a marketable place with current tenants in it as opposed to a single family home where you're like, I need to have the tenants out of there. Um, the real estate agent has told me the place will sell for X amount of dollars more if it's a clean space. So hopefully that's, that's, I, I may have caused more confusion right now. So just let me know if you need further explanation on that. Are we seeing any new questions here? I have a question. Oh, good. Go ahead. Uh, look, I have a question related to what you were just describing. So uh, during the moratorium, a landlord can, in fact, list a property for sale. Is that right? In the, of course, you can sell the home, but can you terminate the tenancy? And there is a mismatch between the governor's moratorium and um, the city moratorium. Uh, and so that's, I have been seeing a lot of owners get tripped up on that, where they see, well, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, well, which one would you say would apply then? Um, can the tenants be evicted in order to uh, show the, the dwelling or do they have to wait until it's sold and then give the tenants notice or can they not uh, evict the tenants at all? You may not, under the mayor and city council's moratorium, you may not terminate the tenancy until the moratorium has expired. Um, the mayor, the way that the emergency order was written was much broader than the governor. And so the city, you know, the way the, the it works sometimes is that the governor sets up a certain set of standards and the mayor incorporates that, but adds extra protections on top of it. So, um, you know, we've heard, you know, that like, if you, you know, basically there's no reason to terminate a tenancy except for health and safety concerns, you know, and that requires, so basically you can't use the sale of a home as things currently stand until March 31st. Now, if you can sell the home, market market it put it on the market with tenants in it and buyers will look at it you can do a notice of entry with the tenants and say look i need to show this property on saturday um i'm going to give you a um a, a proper notice that we want to you know you have to work with the tenants in most cases though because if you if you want to run like an open house during a pandemic, that's gonna be very objectionable to the tenants, you know? So um, I don't know, there's a lot more to add to that. I don't know if you're looking at that or if it's, you know, you're kind of thinking, well, I'll just wait and see what happens with the moratorium. Um, well, so as it stands now, a landlord can in fact list a property for sale and work with the tenants and give them notice that they there's gonna be a showing and then if the property sells, um, well, I called months ago and spoke to one of the other people in your department. And she told me that if it does sell, um, then they, uh, the landlord has to give written notice to the tenants and they have three months from the beginning of the next rental period to actually vacate. Is all of that true? <laughs> Without the moratorium, yes, they, they can do a, um, the, the new owners can can um, put in a notice to occupy the premises, but um, they they would need to wait until the moratorium expires. So, um, so if you had a buyer buying today, closing on the house, um, 
you know, February 7th or to the 6th, sorry, um, then they're, they need to wait until at least April 1st to give that 90 day notice. I see. And obviously, if the moratorium is extended, so so would that date be extended? Well, here's the thing to remember with the moratoriums. There's there's a lot of pressure on the leaders to consider the hardship. Um, you know, so the moratoriums, at least the governor's moratorium has been changed at the point of extension um, at least once. So if we do get an extension on April 1st, will there be any modification to that? order and you know i obviously cannot answer that question because you know it's sometimes these things come down to the wire and and so that would be a really important point to check in with us though and say like we do keep track of these things so if you put in a call to us um we're happy to tell you anything we've learned um when the new moratorium you know should it be extended if it has been extended have there been any changes are there new um allowances for things like sale of a home i see so they could extend the moratorium but change that part of it if they wanted to right and you know so that's the thing you know jeff definitely put it on your calendar to look that up mm -hmm. and any idea how long in advance of the expiration they would make some decision and announce um, i i can tell you that my frustrations with that and it seems like the uh it has come down to the wire like within 24 hours on on at least one of them and so it's i'm i think there's it's a it's a tough decision um we know that um some owners in particular have been really hard hit by the moratorium and so nobody really wants to extend it and we want good news and uh you know with infection rates and stuff like that. I think they're balancing all that and they're putting a lot on the shoulders of the owners. So, and that's tough, that's been real tough. So um, I think to make it at the last minute, I mean, I, I'm getting into motives and I really don't know what the motives are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I asked the question, so <laughs> I asked for your opinion, <laughs> so you're allowed. <laughs> oh. um, so, it, um, other than during the moratorium, what I described is correct, that the landlord would need to give written notice and then 90 days from the beginning of the next rental period is when the tenants would need to vacate. Moratorium, yes. So if you're like, I want to sell the place, um, in fact, um, in, um, it's in Seattle Municipal Code um, 22, 206 160 and then there's um there's this uh, paragraph C1 it goes on and on I apologize but if you um you want to put that in the notice um sometimes people will have uh an attorney help them out with this because we you can always call us too and we can resupply this information so it says elects to sell a single family dwelling unit and gives the tenant at least 90 days written notice prior to the date set for vacating which date shall coincide with the end of the term of a rental agreement or if the agreement is month to month with the last day of a monthly period so essentially what that means is today's february 6th and you count nine days from now that will land you in march april may You'd have to terminate May thirty first. Mm -hmm. That that would be the end of that monthly period if you were delivering the notice today. And then, um, whereas if you had delivered it on March thirtieth, you could have terminated maybe on May first. So right. Um, but be sure to include that language in there. And um, at the risk of dominating the conversation, um, I should. There's a new requirement um, to also any notice to terminate, any notice to enter must include language that refers to the department, to SDCI, um, with our um, website and phone number. 
And so um, be sure to include that in any notice. Um, and and call us basically if you're <laughs> thinking about uh, putting a notice out like that. The 206-684-5700 number. Always a good idea to check in with us. We are eager to help, um, you know, just as, you know, anyone that needs help. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. And, and and during the moratorium, basically, they can't, they really can't sell the, the landlord can't sell the premises um, until the moratorium expires. Is that right? I wouldn't say that you can't sell because that, it, I mean, it depends on what your calculation is. How much more money would I get without the tenants being in there? Um, one thing to keep in mind, too, is um, you can mutually terminate a tenancy. You know, if 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 you if you you can't. So if you look at there's a there's a, the in particular, the governor's moratorium is very explicit about no threats to terminate a tenancy. You can't say, look, you either I need to sell this place. You got to go. Well, that could be considered too threatening the way I just said it, okay? But if you say, hey, you know, um, I need to really sell this place. And, you know, if, you're, if your real estate agent is telling you you'll sell it for 20 grand more without the tenants there, and you think, well, you know, maybe I can offer them, you know, a month off of rent or something. You know, like if you can do a mutual termination and it's, and it's just an offer, you could still do that. Now, in that scenario, I'm spending your money, not my money. So, you know, you have to do your own numbers. <laughs> I understand. And but if um, I guess they can list it, they can show it uh, with the notice we've talked about before to the tenants, but they couldn't actually close a sale until the moratorium ends. Is that right? I don't know. Is that a requirement to sell? I mean. It depends, like, what if it's a single family home that I, I met, would imagine that would be quite difficult to get someone to close on it. Um, but you know, if it's a duplex or a little apartment building, you know, it's there's it's well understood there will be tenants there. So, I think it really, you know, if you were selling um, a single family home with an ADU, you know, where there's just a tenant in the basement but no one on the main floor, that might go. You might be able to. I don't know if actually how the real estate contract um, is set. You know why you couldn't sell it with a contract. I, maybe real estate agents just don't like doing that. I don't know. I honestly, I'm mostly don't. interested in a single family home situation. Yeah. Um, so I don't understand. I don't see any reason why it can't. Like it's impossible to sell. I understand it might not sell for as much. And so then if they sell, the tenants would then uh, fall under what we've discussed up until now, that during the moratorium, they couldn't give notice until the moratorium ends and then the 90-day thing starts. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. That would be good full disclosure. Like, hey, you're buying this place, but it could take you, um, there's going to be an extra long period before you can get, ask the tenants to leave. Right. Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. That's good questions. If there aren't any other questions, I was just going to say, um, I have been a landlord and my experience with the service animal situation is it's a gaping loophole for anyone who wants to have a pet. because they, they can get their physician to say they need uh, um, some service animal, emotional support, whatever. And I've seen you know them just bring in the family pet that they grew up with or something like that, where it's clearly not uh, a pet that's been acquired just because of a certain need. Um, and the, there's nothing the landlord can do about it, essentially. Yeah, I, I definitely hear your concerns about that service animal piece. And and I um, and it's interesting because I've, I've heard both sides from both housing providers and landlords and from uh, tenants who do need 
service animals to be part of their life or part of their household. You know, and, and this is, and I, I just want to just kind of clarify that the animal laws that are in Seattle actually is consistent with the Federal Fair Housing Act. So it is not that Seattle is much more expansive in our service animal definition. We actually um, are consistent with the U.S. Department of Housing Urban Development views around reasonable accommodation and service animals. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Um, one of the things that have that has caused a lot of, um, uh, you know, some challenges is that when folks say, hey, I have to, you know, I need my emotional support animal or comfort animal um, to live with them, and they're able to ask a, a medical provider, it doesn't have to be a doctor, but any sort of person who knows of their disability and their disability need for the service animal, they can make that request to the housing provider. Um, I, I do know that a couple of years ago, one of the things that was a common question among housing providers around service animals is that um, it's not so much the cases where, they're, um, where you have a tenant who goes to their, their medical provider to ask for you know, this particular documentation to submit to the housing, to their landlord, but we've also heard of situations where uh, tenants will go online to quote certify their service animal, and there's a couple ways to actually handle those situations if you do come across those. Um, and I've actually seen a couple of those um, in my work um, through our through our in our investigations of these particular cases. Is is that one of the things that even though there's a lot of information and there's a lot of certifications you can get online. Um, the thing is, is that for a service animal, the person who's issuing that sort of documentation has to be able to meet a couple of criteria. The first one is that they have to be able to show that they understand the definition of disability. And they could, they're certifying, they might be saying this animal is a service animal, but they're also certifying that the person making the request or to certifying their service animal is a person with a disability, okay? So that's the first step. That's the first prong or the first requirement. And that's something that as a housing provider, if the information is vague or is not clear, you can ask for additional documentation. For example, if it's, I was asking, say, um, a landlord to certify my service animal, then, and I'm getting it online, I'm basically saying that the person or the entity online can certify that I am a person with a disability, okay? And I would assume that I had, you know, that that person myself had enough documentation about my medical history or current status to be able to, to to ascertain for the person that I am a person with a disability. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is there enough information other than the person, the applicant who's putting in the information into the computer to be able to know me as a tenant, to know my disability related need for that particular service animal. So these are some of the things that, um, that you can ask the housing provider or as a landlord that if you do get a request, you can ask for information to verify that the person on the other end, whether it be a website or a medical provider, again, I have to say is that have to be a physician or nurse practitioner, but someone who can a, a determine that person is a person with a disability and has a disability related need for that service animal. So um, those are ways to do it. but it does not mean that if it's pretty obvious that the person is disabled and has a disability related need for that service animal, it doesn't mean that you have to burden that, that person to provide all the medical documentation. If, it, if in fact, you know the person has a sight impairment or has some sort of a disability that is something you can see or you can visualize in that person. So it is a very, 
you know, and it's a case by case situation. If there's any housing providers on this call or in this meeting that have further questions, I invite you to contact us and so that we can provide you more information in those situations. It sounds good, but my experience has been when you say disability, that can mean emotional disability. And uh, if you have, for example, a long standing family doctor and you go to them, gee, I've been feeling a little anxious lately. Well, OK, no problem. I'll write you the letter you need. It's that simple. Yeah, it is, you know, it. it but. You know, if you look at the demographics in the United States, I believe I, I, I can't remember. I don't have the, the information. It's like one in five individuals have a disability where a lot of those individuals that have disabilities are not physical disabilities. They're actually mental disabilities. And so those diagnoses are considered disabilities under the DSM book or whatever. I can't remember that book that all the different lists of disabilities are listed out. But there's all types of disabilities that folks have. And, you know, it is, although we, though I may not consider someone disabled, to them or to their medical provider, that person could be disabled. I'm not a medical provider or a medical professional to be able to make those diagnoses or those determinations of an individual. And I also right. wouldn't want to be put myself in that situation either. I understand. And of course, we I think we would all agree that if it's legitimate, there's no problem. But the problem is that it's way too easy for someone to get that letter that says, oh, this person has an emotional need um, when maybe there really isn't one, but they're, they really want to have their family pet with them. So they will find somebody that knows the family or that's been a uh, long-term physician or something who will have a very, very broad definition of that disability. Are we seeing any new questions, by the way? I just wanted to check in and um, I'm not able to see as easily if we're seeing anything in chat or if you have any new people in the room that are kind of sitting on the sidelines looking to ask a question or. No new questions in the chat. So if anybody has a question, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question if you like. Is there an easy way to know if the moratorium is extended and furthermore, what provisions have been changed? It, it is, it's, it's kind of a news thing, I would say. Like I know um, it's been a breaking news story every time it's come out sort of. Um, so right now, the current moratorium would expire on March 31st. And I think it was, Last Thursday, for instance, I saw news articles in both uh, Crosscut and Seattle Times about steps that the state legislature is trying to take um, to, I mean, from the politician, you know, the, the, the consideration for the citizens, you know, the whole population is a lot of tenants are going to be behind on the rent. And could get moved quickly into into an eviction scenario, kind of fall off a cliff. Um, and there's all the owners that are doing the evictions are short on rent. So there there's a need on both sides there. And the political, you know, in the in the state senate, they're trying to work out if there should be a fund to sort of see so that not everyone's falling off that cliff when the moratorium expires. So to me, I think there's a lot of media focus on what's gonna happen March 31st, April 1st. The um, state Senate is working on that. So, um, you know, I don't know if, you know, I, I don't know if our website itself will update like as quickly as just keeping an eye on the, you know, Seattle Times, Crosscut, um, you know, any, you know, media sources. Um, 
you can always call us and say, hey, what happened? Because we, we will do an analysis as soon as we know what happened. Um, you know, it can take us a few days to get back to you, you know, but, uh, you know, so is that, I don't know if that's kind of a, you know, it puts it out of our zone at SDCI, but I think that's a fairly good answer. Um, and the governor's moratorium will be, he has a website, like if you t look at Jay Inslee, um, you know, his Washington.gov type page, he'll have a list of his proclamations as they're called. Um, so that's a, a, a place to go for that. And so, yeah, so it's going to be- link, the governor's link into the chat. Oh, you got, okay, earlier. great, thanks. Yeah, so. If anybody needs it, I can drop it back in again. Just yeah. Me. Thanks, Paul. And the phone number to call is the one you mentioned earlier. 206-684-5700. Yeah, that'll okay. get you to my. Great. Thank you. And a little slow these days. So if you if you wanted to call on like March 22nd or something, that might be, uh, you know, I, I could understand calling a few days ahead of time. Oh, so you get a call back that's more timely. Great, I'll do that, thank you. And just so everyone knows, this this is a transcript being created through this. Um, it's essentially a recorded event, and then that way um, there's a, a landing page for these home fairs, and that this will be sort of a resource um, if people want to sort of see, you know, what kind of questions people are asking and what kind of answers are being given. Um, something to keep in mind. Are there any oh, other questions? Oh, Go ahead and unmute yourself. How big is our group right now? I'm just curious. I can't uh, really we have see. about, let me see, um, we have eight participants plus uh, three of us on the panel, so 11 total. So I might just return to something that um, uh, Mike had suggested. Um, um, Mike Chin is uh, my colleague at Seattle Office of Civil Rights, um, sort of going through some of the um, issues that have been coming up a lot. And um, since we've got a few people here, I would encourage you to interrupt me to ask a question. Um, you know, not everyone's jumping in with a question. Um, so with that being said, we've had a lot of new legislation um, that has impacted um, including um, a new notice requirement um, for notices to enter or notices to terminate tenants. Um, there's a requirement um, in the Seattle Municipal Code um, under prohibited acts, it's uh, 22206180K, that all notices need to refer to the department, to SDCI, give our phone number and our website and, and and let the tenant know if they have questions about the entry or about the termination that they can contact SDCI at 206-684-5700 and give our website. Um, and so if you are someone that might be giving that kind of notice, just keep that in mind, that's an extra requirement. And we will rescind the notices if we get a complaint and it's not in there, we will rescind those notices. So that's something that just got implemented, I think, November of 2019. Another thing is the, um, there's a roommate bill, um, which is, um, we haven't seen a lot of impact from that yet, but it does give tenants um, a right to bring in a roommate into the lease. Um, and then we've also got some notice requirements that will be um, coming online at the expiration of the moratorium. So you have tenants that are um, behind on their rent, 
um, you know, they'll need to, you'll need to make sure that they know they can use COVID-19 if they've been impacted on it um, as a ground for defending an eviction. Um, if you haven't put that into your 14 day notice, um, that that could be grounds to have the case, you know, um, tossed out and you might have to start over again. So there's a few things like that. Um, I just raised that since we've got a group here um, and sort of Mike was asking what some of the issues we've been dealing with. And a lot of it's this new legislation. So hopefully everyone's keeping up on that. And uh... Sorry, was that question? I think that um, we did not hear. Uh, Rumi, I believe, um, were you trying to ask a question? All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions? You can can I be heard? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Your name, okay. please. Uh, Donald Spedich. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I heard talk about a service animal. Uh, I'm a landlord. Um, my experience is that um, I have people bringing in pets, even though I say no pets allowed, and I don't know how to get them out and, and uh, evict them on those grounds or even get rid of their pet. You can give them a notice. They can say, um, you know, we got rid of our pet, but they didn't. I, I, I just don't know how to deal with the pet situation. Yeah, that that, that is a tricky, a tricky thing that comes up because the thing is, is that the fair housing addresses protections if a person with a disability has a disability related need for a service animal. And I have seen those situations where someone brings in a pet, an unauthorized pet into a non-pet building, right? And then I think that's what you described. And, um, and then later when the landlord finds out, oh, this person has a pet, they will then go through the paperwork through their medical provider to be able to include them um, as, um, as a service animal and therefore being um, that disability and reasonable accommodation is then protected under the Fair Housing Act as well as the Seattle Open Housing Ordinance. So the thing is, and I think there's a question here, it says lease contract says no pets, but brings them in. How would you address that? The thing is, is that reasonable accommodation is a change in your policy or practice in order to allow a person with a disability to enjoy their dwelling. So that is word for word from the Fair Housing Act. Courts have looked at that language to be, uh, have interpreted that under the Fair Housing Act to be very broad, to be, and also to include service animals. So even though you have a lease agreement that says no pets, and someone comes in and later needs a service animal, uh, um, then they then there is a requirement that the housing provider changes or allows the person to have an accommodation. And therefore, 
they would be um, they would be allowed to have that even though the lease agreement says um, no pets. And that's the same thing with um, rules and regulations like residence rules and regulations if you have that on the property. If the properties, if the rules and regulations say no pets, a reasonable accommodation is a change of a policy or practice for a person with a disability to enjoy their dwelling. And so even those on the contract, the federal law as well as the city ordinance would trump in both of those cases. Now, there are some exceptions to the reasonable accommodation, okay? Um, and usually they don't apply in a, this context of a service animal. Number one, if the person does not have a disability related need for a service animal, there is no response requirement for the service animal, uh, for the landlord to allow a person a service animal, okay? So there's no nexus. There is no disability or disability related need. Number two, if it creates a fundamental alteration of your services in order to accommodate the reasonable accommodation. So for example, let's say you have a tenant who requires the landlord to come by um, at nine noon and five o'clock to take out their garbage. If that's not a fundamental, that's the alteration of the services you provide as a landlord, then you do not, that is not considered a reasonable accommodation. The third example of where reasonable accommodation, where there is no need to provide a reasonable accommodation is if providing an accommodation would provide a direct threat or harm to individual or property. So even though some landlords will say, well, the service animal or the wheelchair may ding up the walls or the service animal may pee on the carpet. All of those examples is not a is not considered a direct threat or eminent threat to persons or property. Um, those aren't examples. Examples of that would be if a uh, tenant asks for the landlord to put in, to remove a, a load bearing wall in the apartment building, um, that would cause some structural concerns um, and that would not be a reasonable accommodation to remove a load bearing wall uh, for that structure. And then the fourth example um, of where a reasonable accommodation would not necessarily be um, provided is if, um, let's see, did I, did I, I think I think I mentioned three of them. Let's see. Oh, it, it, with the fourth one is if it creates an administrative or financial hardship um, to the landlord. So for example, let's say you have a duplex, um, one, on, one unit on the top, one unit on the ground floor, and the tenant asks for the landlord to put in an elevator so that they can, they can go into their second floor unit, which is in a duplex building. And let's just say that is the only property that you have. That would, could, that would be a considerable financial hardship for the landlord who owns this duplex to put in a wheel uh, to put in a an elevator. However, a reasonable combination could look like you would let that person out of their lease um, so that they can find a unit that would be suitable to their disability related need. I hope well, I answered I, that question. Yeah. Uh, well, I hear what you're saying. What what I'm saying is um, it's hard to prove that a person even has a an animal in their unit and, unless you you don't see it, but you hear it barking occasionally. And, and then if, maybe if you don't hear it, you think it's gone, but then you hear it barking again. It's just hard to prove that they even have an animal in their unit. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, yeah, you have these um, mystery, mystery animals that come in and go and you don't see them, but you know, you can hear them. Um, yeah, I, I can sympathize that what you're saying, but it is, um, if it's, you know, I think that if a person has an unauthorized pet is one thing in a no pet building, but it's a different thing is if that person has a disability related need for a service animal in order to enjoy their dwelling, that's going to be treated differently under the Fair Housing Act. Sure. Um, 
I guess I'd like to move on with a different question, if that's okay. Yes. Um, okay, so um, I hear talk about, uh, um, you know, being competent, or I should, maybe I should say uh, rental money coming out due to COVID to help pay the rent. And what I find is that some tenants, they might have the money, but they're not paying me anyway. And so if the money goes to the tenant and says, okay, here's some money and you can pay your rent with it, it doesn't make it to me. I, I need it to be authorized in some manner of which there's proof that this money actually reaches me as a landlord. Is, have you heard anything about that? Uh, well, what I, I, I'm aware that King County has a fund right now. Uh, those are negotiated, uh, you know, because with the King County program, and I'm going off of kind of what I've heard, so I, I would definitely take this with a grain of salt, but that they will look at the amount of money that's owed, and then they'll offer, we'll pay you, you know, probably a percentage of the total in, and then, you, you know, it's sort of a situation where, you know, if you think like, well, I'm never going to get a penny from these people. Um, and, and then, you know, well, here's, you know, say half of the total, but you have to agree not to collect on the remainder, but in that, oh, you're fully advised, you know, you don't enter that deal unless you want to. And I think that the county would direct the payment to you. I think maybe if someone's getting unemployment or they're getting money, uh, from the federal government, um, I just don't think those programs are, I, I, th I just don't think they're administered in that granular way to, you know, kind of let the creditors get in front of the payment. So I do think that that could be part of what you're experiencing. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but um, I do think, I, I know that there's discussion. I just don't know if it's going to come to pass or not, but I, I, I know that the state legislature is looking at um, a relief fund, but I think that would be something that you would be fully advised on. If the if the tenant was trying to access those funds, um, you would be involved in that. So um, yes, um, it, it it's it's a tough position to be in right now. So I'm I'm sorry that you're going through that. Yeah, I I just like tenants that claim they have a need for rent relief to send in some form that says, yes, I need rent relief, please send the money to this particular landlord. And, and of course, I'd like them to suggest sending it to me. So when we come out of the moratorium, they will there will be a requirement if the tenant, you know, wants to defend in a non-payment case or non-payment of rent, they will have to complete an affidavit that describes how they were impacted by COVID. Um, and that's not something that the city will actually, we, we will make sure that the notice has the required language on it that alerts them to these requirements. But we will not be helping them do the affidavit because that's advocacy. So the, the a tenant that's behind in the rent will need to be very, they're going to have to have the ability to describe what happened and probably get some assistance and make a, a statement about it. Um, and if so, if in that scenario, um, you know, they should be, if they've been genuinely impacted, then it should be very clear. And, you know, there may be some, they may have some additional rights to a payment plan in that situation. So, um, you know, I, I think that addresses some of your concerns. I know that it's just an economic hardship also, and that's something that we're not doing enough about, but that's that's a huge problem <laughs> beyond what SDCI does. <sighs> well, okay, I just, I just wanted to make it clear that that's what's happening is that um, I, I think I have tenants that can pay and are just choosing not to pay. Um, so when, when when they Let me money, say this. I, I will tell you that um, I, I probably spend um, 
I probably take more calls from tenants than owners. And if I'm on the phone with the tenant, you know, my unit does a lot of this work. We always let the tenant know that they should be paying the rent if they can, because it's it's if if you can pay, you should pay. We you know that the department is very aware of these problems, and we are um, we also know that there's tenants that are making very difficult choices. You know, with with if they're you know unemployed, you know that's one thing. But if they can pay that their liability continues to accrue. And we're very upfront with them. Don't, don't um, avoid pain if you can, you know, but I mean, we also let people make decisions for themselves. So it's, it's a difficult, it's just hard right now. That there's just no getting around it. Yeah, honest people uh, will pay or make efforts to pay but dishonest people are just holding their money because they're getting away with it. And, I, and I'm dealing with some of those people. I'm sorry to hear that. That's, uh, um, you know, and we've heard some some astounding things. So I'm, I'm sorry you're going through that. All right. I, I don't have any more questions in that regard. Yeah, if anyone else wants to jump in, um, so far we've been able to um, take questions. Um, people have been able to just ask. There's also a chat function, but so far we, you know, we're not getting overwhelmed. If anyone wants to jump in with a, a you know, ask a question, um, it is recorded. Um, just, but uh, you know, just talking about landlord tenant issues. So. Is the recording going to be transcribed or only audio? If I understand correctly, it'll be well. It is transcribed um, electronically, so I think that will be available. So, um, yeah, I would. I don't think anyone has talked about any specifics. So I, I that and that would be something to avoid. Um, but. Um, this is sort of a resource, we're creating a resource out of this. And so, um, um, been trying to make the announcement every few minutes so that people are aware of it. And where would I go to um, either access the audio or the written um, transcript? STCI Home Fairs. Um, and I, um, the link is definitely in the chat. It just might have gotten I might be way up in the chat by now. So I, um, my colleague uh, uh, I, again. Uh, might drop it in again. Yep. Thank you. Are there any other questions that you guys just can unmute yourself and ask the questions? Looks like we're okay with people jumping in. How many do we currently have in the room, Bob? We have a total of three, so uh, seven participants and three of us on the panel. Um, again, this is a question and answer session. We're not doing any presentations and um, we are, we'll be here until three o'clock. Do we have any um, tenants in the group? I think so far most of my responses have been oriented towards um, owner type questions. I assume maybe that these things usually generate more participation than tenant participation. But 
I don't know if anyone wants to tell us kind of what their background is um, in property ownership or something like that. And if they have any, you know, general concept they want to explore or, you know, any questions about upcoming legislation, um, you know, what the landscape's going to look like with more talks, you know, when it, whatever that might be, you know, any questions that you have, um, we've got the city's here for another 40 minutes, so go for it. Uh, a quick water break. It'll only take me like one minute. That's just stepped into the room too. Um, uh, we're happy to take any questions. Um, we've been uh, going through quite a bit of things. Um, it's kind of a Q&A setup. So um, either write a question into the chat, um, but we're, we've had enough room for people just to go ahead and ask questions. Um, if anyone's already asked a series of questions and something new has occurred to them, go ahead. Hello? Yes. Since we're sitting here in silence, I'm thinking of another subject that I probably wouldn't bring up except that there's nothing but silence anyway. Uh, so I'll bring it up. Um, there used to be a three-day pay or quit notice. It has since changed to a 14-day pay or quit notice. I, when, when there was a three-day pay or quit notice, I found that the tenants actually had more than three days to to pay or resolve uh, their tenancy. It sounds like they're kicked out in three days, but it usually takes a month or a month and a half, something like that. It takes longer. Um, so my question is, what kind of a Herculean effort is involved in getting 
the 14 day pay or quit uh, rule reversed back to three days or five days or, or something less than 14. Um, I think that's in my zone. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, okay, so this level is the, is the best answer because the state changed the rule and the 14 day notice form itself is actually described in the RCW under the, as we call it, the RLTA, the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. RCW 5918. Uh, so you would, it, it was the state legislature that enacted the change. So it'll be the state legislature that uh, would change it back. Um, so I think get it changed back. It, uh, I, I don't know. I that's a I I am having trouble. I mean, because the rule was the way it was for quite a long time, and you know, conceptually, it really adds eleven days of a notice period that was formerly three days. But like you're saying, it takes a month anyway. So in the in the scope of a process or procedure that takes four or five weeks. Adding an eleven-day period in there, you can argue whether that's a, a hardship or not. I don't know. What's your perspective on it? Well, my my perspective on it is that, like I said, I think a tenant had plenty of time to respond with the three-day notice. Um, it it just it just takes that many more days, like we said, longer to to get a non-paying tenant out of a unit just seems like it wasn't oh go ahead i was just saying it it just seems like it, it imposed a greater burden or financial hardship on the landlord and, and uh isn't really necessary yeah i know that there was a part of the discussion around it was that when for, there were some sometimes it would happen that the tenant was served with a three day notice and and then the if the owner was very prepared, they might serve a summons and complaint you know literally you know the fourth day and with the service of the summons and complaint then there would be an introduction of a lot of additional charges and so the, one of the ideas with the 14 day is that there might be more ability to arrange for, you know, payment by other agencies, you know, depending on the type of tenancy. Now, I think maybe what you're describing is a tenant that just stopped paying the rent and they're just giving up. And, and in that scenario, I, I see your perspective, but you know, if there was a way to say, like, can we get an agency to come in and pay five hundred dollars? You know, if they're, you know, if they've just fallen short and they're, you know, then that extra fourteen days might be a cushion to try and save tenancies. You know, and um, you know, there's a lot of issues going on in there. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, I know that the RHA WA um, does lobbying on that issue. And I think you'd find um, that they would, you know, if th that would be a good place to look. I don't know if you're familiar with the RHA, but they would yeah, be the most likely. I, I, um, I, I suppose it could be brought up with them. They're actually, that's a good idea. Uh, they'd be good to address it, if anyone. Yeah, I mean, they'd be the most likely to um, counter the current um, position. Um, it's a work in progress. That's no question about that. You know, we're, it's only started a couple years ago, so we're kind of learning what comes from that, right? Uh-huh. Uh, 
Um, the floor is open. This is our uh, last uh, uh, questioner, I think Jack. Um, you know, we were having a little dead air in the in the meeting, and uh, you know, we still have a half an hour to go over some things. Um, so, if anyone has uh, now, it is recorded, so um, I would keep your inquiries general. Um, but you know, as if it, you should feel comfortable though to go ahead and um, ask any question. Um, if we can't answer it, if it's beyond what we do, then we'll let you know. But ask anything. Actually, Alec, I actually have to. Um, the last caller actually brought up some things that I forgot uh, that I would just like to tag on. And these, this is where uh, fair housing protections and kind of landlord tenant um, protections kind of touch. And so one of the things that kind of brought to mind when the caller mentioned around, or, or maybe you had mentioned around, Alec, you mentioned subsidies and things like that. So um, in the city of Seattle, um, housing subsidies is is a protected class. So it doesn't, it could be short-term subsidies, it can be long-term subsidies. It, it includes not just housing choice vouchers, otherwise known as Section 8, it can do VASH vouchers, all types of vouchers that are government issued or, um, or even issued by nonprofit organizations, either long-term or short-term. When I think of that long-term, I'm thinking about like one year, like a housing choice voucher, but it could also be as short as one month. So one of the things that passed probably maybe three, four years ago was the alternative source of income protections. And that was a amendment to the Seattle Open Housing Ordinance. And there are a couple of things that kind of brought uh, kind of came to mind when you were talking about subsidies. And I think this might be something just to kind of consider as well. So because housing choice vouchers, similar or sources of incomes um, or subsidies is is a protected class, landlords or housing providers cannot discriminate against applicants who use alternative sources of income or subsidies to for housing costs, okay? That also includes not just applicants, but even current tenants. So when you were talking about the possibility of government possibly paying to help subsidize, you know, some of the rent that might've been lost during the period of COVID, that is one thing that housing providers have a responsibility to do is to accept all, any or all either um, subsidies um, that may come from a governmental entity, but it can also include nonprofits. It also requires housing providers to cooperate with subsidy with um, subsidy programs. So if you know county comes up with, hey, we're going to be paying, you know, uh, you know, being subsidized you know, tenant rent and things like that, a landlord or housing provider know we're not going to accept those third party subsidies, whether it's from a government entity or from a nonprofit. Um, the other thing is that if in a sense, and I think the last caller mentioned where there was a 14 day pay rent or vacate scenario, if a you know if that in that situation um, comes up, a tenant reach to a nonprofit or government entity to submit what is called a written pledge payment for past or any current housing costs that is owed by the tenant. So that is puts in a pledge a nonprofit or government entity says, hey, we are going to cover past due rent housing costs. And if they do that, it does have to engage and be willing to allow that third party payor to provide payment on behalf of the tenant so that they can become current in their past rent or past housing costs. So that being said, the reason I wanted to kind of flag that is because 
if there's a landlord who is saying, no, I'm only going to accept a check from, you know, Jane Doe tenant in the city of Seattle, that would be a potential discrimination case based on alternative sources of incomes and subsidies, because it doesn't necessarily have to come from that particular tenant who's on the lease agreement. It can come from a third party payor or a subsidy like a governmental entity or a nonprofit to basically pay um, whatever the current to make that person current. I know that's not the question the caller had in mind, but I do want to just kind of share the fair housing context or fair housing lens to that scenario. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I do think there has been a policy shift toward less disruption. Like if we can keep a tenant housed, you know, and of course they do need to pay the rent, but if, if there are ways to pay the rent that may be non-traditional and not exactly the way you would like to get it, but you know, we have that's that policy decision is being made to be more open to that, and we're seeing that reflected in some of the new rules. Um, does does anyone want to jump in at this point? N not necessarily on this subject, but anyone that's in the you know um, came here to uh, for the Q and A and has a a cue for us to uh, give an answer to. Um, I was going to, uh, um, you know, mention too that, that um, kind of along what you were saying, Mike, is that as we come out of COVID, um, payment plans are going to be an important piece. You know, if you have a non-paying tenant right now, um, it's, I mean, it, of course, if they haven't paid rent for many months, they might have an insurmountable issue but there there's you definitely want to keep an eye on legislation you know which should be reported in the papers because i know there's going to be there's at least some effort to try and get funds available um to bring into these situations to see if we can keep people in place and you know if the issue is non-payment of rent then there might be a lot of funds available and the the you know we may be entering a different era where it's like you know before you could do the three day notice and just move on. I think maybe was which has its you know I can understand from a business perspective that you this person you sort of just want to try a new tenant, but I think that that also is not necessarily where the policy is now and what, what we're seeing is you're going to have to be open to these alternative funding sources and to you know if they want to access funds that are available from maybe the state possibly we'll see you know or from the county that you know and they want to bring that into a package for a payment plan you know there's there's going to be you know some it's going to be a little different but the idea is to get the owners paid. I mean, I, I do think that's a value that's being put out there. I mean, I guess I'm sort of trying to be positive. <laughs> so <laughs> um, any questions out? Yeah, I'm the guy that started with the 14 days pay or quit. Um, and um, anyway, my question is, at the end of this COVID, if I've got a tenant with a, uh, oh, I don't know, owing $10,000 in back rent, and, and I evict them, and I'm sitting there $10,000 in a hole plus the cost of eviction, am I going to have the ability to submit to some government agency um, my hardship debt situation and try to, so, someone's going to compensate me? That's a great question. Uh, so um, I probably don't have a good answer to it. Um, 
you know, because what I would be concerned about is there's a lot of the assistance right now is, you know, every time I've seen an assistance type of thing, it's geared around saving and preserving the tenancy. So I would have, so this is an answer, but I would have a concern that if the tenancy is broken, there's no tenancy to rescue there, that those funds, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but I, my guess is that those funds would not be prioritized in that situation because there would not be a tenancy to save. We're not like, you know, there's not a, like a family that's in an apartment that we could save is, you know, probably how those funds are prioritized. Say, so, okay, well, we'll turn to a different situation where there is a situation, you know, I think the county already has a fund that's that's up and running. Uh, King County um, has like uh, a fund running already um, that will negotiate, you know, kind of an agreement to get at least a portion of the rent. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we'll see if anything comes forward. So I, I do think that that would be a consideration, you know, what your tough it's tough being business you know like when when what's the best decision out there you know to sort of pursue these people through a judgment sort of a classic collection action um and maybe you're very skeptical that that will ever work and it might be better to see if maybe there could be some aid from the county or from the state coming along um and also, I have no idea if any of this is addressed in the stimulus package that the federal government is working on right now. So um, I, I just don't know. I, I I think we'll have better information on that um, in the department, you know, a month or two from now. Um, so, you know, it's kind of an incomplete answer, but I, I, I would be concerned for sending the tenants, if they've lost possession, then the the funds might not be accessible to you. I would be concerned about that. Uh, I, I understand the I understand the prioritization, um, but yeah, I don't expect I'm going to be able to collect. Yeah, that's a man. That's a tough situation. Yeah, the, the tough situation part is that I've got my hands tied and I'm forced to continue losing um, the p possibility of rental income. And, and you, I'm sure you understand that, but that's my situation. Yeah, you almost wonder if you'd be like, you know, you know, if you could negotiate, you know, offer, uh, you know, if you quit by the end of the month, I'll forgive all your debt. But for some people, that's not really a good deal. So it's a it's a tough position to be in. You know, if they just don't have any resources and you're having to support them right now. Um, but I, I think it's also important. You know, we're not able always to give satisfying answers here. But um, you know, you've really done your part to help everyone out during this pandemic. You know, if you've you know, and I know that it it's it, it's whatever a thin the thin thing to do, but I, I do thank you for, you know, allowing these people to remain in place, um, you know, and have, you know, less friction, you know, less people, you know, there's, you know, people have been able to stay in place. And um, I, I think that we do need to take some time to thank owners, you know, who really were asked to do a lot. You know, I know when we saw the moratorium come through just a year ago, I guess it was what, middle March, middle of March last year. Um, it was like, I mean, like something I'd never seen in my life, period. I mean, it was unprecedented. And uh, you, you knew right then that the burden was going to be on the owners and um, you guys have taken a huge burden. So um, I think there's room to talk about that in policy circles, you know, I'm a little outside of that. Sometimes, 
you know, there's we're, we might get a little involved in that. So I'm always open to elevating um, owner concerns. And I think there's a way to find, you know, small owners will be more impacted, you know, so. Any any uh, additional concerns you want to raise, or is there anyone else out there? Um, got uh, we're almost down to just under fifteen minutes here. We've got um, got Seattle Office of Civil Rights here. We've got SDCI is here. Um, so um, you know, especially if you've got questions about renters, um, you know. Um, different points in your tenancy, whether it's uh, screening issues, um, you know, uh, managing a tenancy, um, you know, entering a unit, um, you know, just cause notices. Um, I don't know. Well, how many people are um, in the room right now? We have three participants left, not counting us. Okay, okay. Remember, you can also enter a chat question and uh, also um, if, you know, we have some resources that we're kind of expecting to dribble out as questions come up. Is there any, um, any, any particular resources that anyone um, is wanting? Um, I know we shared a couple of a couple times we've shared a link to a new uh, renter's handbook uh, that is um, that you would hand out at the beginning of the tenancy with the lease. Just, um, make sure you're uh, tracking that. I'm not sure if it's fully implemented yet or if it's sort of been drafted and we're going to be introducing it over the next few days. I'm not or week. I'm not quite sure what that process, where we are in that process, but um, the old one was, I think, last updated in 2018. So this will be a nice update. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. In a in a rooming house situation, um, what kind of notice does the landlord have to give to the tenant in a bedroom before the, if they need to have access to that room for, I don't know, repair or inspection or whatever? Okay, so the rooming house is an odd thing, um, and um, so. The department's position on this is that if it's a rooming house and the owner does not occupy it, um, then the owner needs to give notice to come into the house. Um, and in that scenario, it would to enter the room, it would be the same notice. So say you need to do a you need to install a smoke detector on schedule. It's been, I don't know, it's a necessary repair. That's a 48 hour notice. And you would need to include um, information on the department in the notice, give 48 hours, give good specific information. Um, and uh, if there's, and include your phone number. And, you know, unless there's, that's how you get your right to enter. Now, if the tenant says that's not a good time for me, I'd like to be present. Can we do it? Let's just schedule it, you know, the following day. Or can you come on Saturday? You know, that kind of thing. Then, OK, sure, I'll update the notice. Um, but if they don't object, you have a if you do that written process, it's very formal. But then you get the right to enter. Right. So um, as opposed to. I think the department sometimes people handle things through text messages. I just would be concerned with a rooming house situation 
where if you don't put the, the notice that you'll be in the common area, then the other tenants might take offense. Like if you're handling things through text messages and the person's like, sure, come on over. I mean, that would be consent from one of the owners. I mean, you can always obtain consent. It's just, if they say that they don't want you to come, you have to respect that if you haven't given the written notice. Um, right. It's, it's my a habit. Tough... Go ahead. Sorry. My habit has been an email to everyone in the house. So here's what I tell tenants a lot of time, and this is maybe a little, It's it doesn't meet the requirements of the rules. Okay, that's what I'll say. Okay, like an email is is under the RCW, a written notice means a notice that's that you can put on a door. Okay, that's a written notice. That's something that you take over to the house, you knock on the front door and say, here's your notice. Or if they're not home, you leave it on the door. Okay, but we also know that life has changed a lot since some of these rules were written and if you send an email, that can be a lot nicer. Like the tenants might actually prefer that. And I share that perspective with tenants sometimes. It's like the department will enforce an imp against an improper entry, but at the same time, you do you want the owner to show up every time they need to access the unit? Do you want them coming to the front door and knocking on the door and then putting this paper to you? Or would you rather just get an email from them or a text? There, I think there's room for people, if things are going well, that if, if the department never hears about it, that's okay, as long as everyone's, you know. Now, sometimes I think when things get to a certain point where maybe the tenant is feels like there's been too much entry, they're feeling protective of their space, they may demand a more formal process. And that, mm -hmm. and then we have to respect that and say, okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the written notice and I'll, I'll include my phone number on it. And I'm scheduling myself to come in on Wednesday uh, from uh, noon to five. I've got to, you know, um, I've got to work on the window so I'm going to be there from noon to five. Here's my phone number. Um, and um, if you have any questions about this notice, you can contact SDCI. Here's their phone number and their website. So that's the paragraph K of uh, 22206.180. So you so that that is a way to sort of formalize it. And then there's you put your phone number on that notice. And then if they don't call you and they don't call us you've got your right to enter there's no problem there if they call you and say wednesday's not good i i need to you know a different day that's good and we will tell the tenants when they call and complain to us we'll say you have to be reasonable the department is not really able to define reasonable in every circumstance but it, it cannot tell you that you can never come into their room again. That's unreasonable. <laughs> so, so we try to make sure that the tenants are aware of that also. You know. Yeah, so. sounds good. sounds good. What about um, if you need as a landlord to take care of something in the yard? Can you just go there anytime you want? Oh man, that's that's a great <laughs> question. That. Okay, so sometimes there's something in the lease that's fairly clear that the, you know, that the owner has a lawn care operation or does lawn care. That makes it a little easier if it's in the lease. Then um, I, mean, I guess part of the question is what we enforce against. Um, I personally, this is maybe a little personal, um, but. If it's something where, like going to knock on someone's front door, sometimes that some houses are set up where that feels like dangerous. Like uh, so they might have a dog running around. There's a chain link fence. You don't want to go in. It feels like the yard is sort of a 
personal space. But anyone can knock on your front door, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know what the prohibition is on that. Um, but, you know, we do get complaints about that sometimes. And I would think it would be better to provide a heads up to provide a notice if if you have a tenant that's becoming very protective to say, okay, let's do a formal notice. If you want to just avoid having any grief from the department, mm -hmm. you know, if the tenant's going to complain to us, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously we hope that that's something that can be worked out. You know, I'll spare you having to cut the grass. I'll come do it myself. That seems like kind of a nice deal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, obviously, as you've said a few times, um, each situation could be different, depends on your relationship with the tenants, so. Right, right, exactly. I understand. Well, thank you for keeping this interesting, you know. Well, <laughs> well thanks for your help. This is a rare opportunity. What? Right, you've got, you've got uh, the power of Office of Civil Rights, we've got HWA, you know, in the background, you've got SCCI here, so, you know, <laughs> why not take advantage? Yeah, um, okay, so I'm assuming no one else has a burning question, I'd be happy to yield the floor um, if they do, uh, but if not, um, the first in time ordinance, um, I assume that's to prevent discrimination. And if so, um, aren't there laws already on the books that would prevent discrimination in just about every way you could think of? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. And that's a great question because you're right. Um, you know, the Federal Fair Housing Act, which was established in 1968, was a law that would that prohibited discrimination. But I, I but I think discrimination looks a little bit different when it was in the 1960s than it is now. And this new law around first in time was really to address biases. And biases is something that everyone has, uh, whether it's whether you acknowledge it or not, whether it's implicit, it could be explicit bias. Bias is everything, is, is everywhere, right? But in terms of, in the context of housing, biases come up in the sense where a housing provider may say, I'm going to speak to five different candidates and decide who I like best. It's not based on the actual objectivity of whether the person can pay rent, whether the person is a good tenant, whether the person um, is, 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 is overall can meet the minimum requir requirements. So first in time was actually a law that was passed based on some of the testing results that we see. So Office for Civil Rights conducts a lot of fair housing testing in the city. We're one of the only enforcement agencies in um, in the U.S. that has our own in-house testing program. And what we saw was there was a lot of bias that was identified during those tests that would indicate that housing providers have preferences towards one group of people over another. For example, if um, some of the tests that we saw in the past, where if you were African American, you were more likely asked, "Do you have a criminal history?" than if you're a white tenant or a white applicant. Or if you're a Latino or Hispanic, what we found in our test was that housing providers were more likely to ask, oh, um, is there another second income that is coming in you know, to pay, able to pay the rent? While a white was not asked the same type of questions. So what we found in those tests would be indication that biases do play out in the housing transaction. And so it just, long story short, and I know we're at three o'clock right now, but that is why first in time went into place. It was to try to mitigate bias and mitigate the subjectivity that housing providers would use to try to decide who they wanted to rent and who they didn't want to rent to. The only flaw that I see in that, and I, I feel exists in real life is, you mentioned the word minimum requirements. And as a landlord, I'm looking for the best tenant, not the, there's not a minimum. I'm looking for the best. But and I understand, yeah, but yeah. But you know, I, I think one thing I learned 
in, in, in grade schools, you never judge a book by its cover. And I think that's true with people. That if you think who is the best candidate, you know, who is the best applicant for housing, it should speak to whether they can pay their rent, whether they're a good neighbor, whether they don't have any issues of, of not paying rent or whatever the whatever other criteria. And when I talk about criteria, it's like what are those minimum requirements, minimum qualifications that you look for in a tenant? And it shouldn't be based on whether the person's race or any other protected class, because we all have biases about what that could look like or who that person is. But what I'm saying is that in a situation where we're talking about how biases play out, what you should be looking at is what are those minimum criteria? Is it three times the rent? Is it someone who has a good uh, tenant history? Someone that doesn't have any sort of eviction history? Any of those things would be indicators whether they would be a good tenant. And those are actually much more specific and much more well documented to use as, 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 as a criteria than, than other types of perception that you may have. All right. I guess uh, I would use an example where uh, I've got one applicant who's had a job for a week and I have another one who's got a, a much higher level job and has been there for five years. Um, according to the ordinance, if the one with the week long job comes in first, they get the unit. That's correct. And so if the one who has and they still meet the income to rent ratio, you can put on your minimum criteria that you require three years of employment history. You can put those requirements forward um, if that is something that you're going to all of your applicants who apply for housing. Just make it clear that those are the criteria that you're going to use, those standards. And you can say, I want to have three years of uninterrupted employment history. And as a landlord, you can decide to put that into your minimum criteria to rent to someone. Right. But the problem is that you may have a time when you say, well, it's uh, an odd time of year or the month or something to be renting. So I'll take the best candidate I can find, but maybe this person has only one year of employment and I'll be happy to take yeah. them. And now I've, I'm yeah. stuck with my three year minimum. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that I think there's a, I mean, how, what are those minimum criteria that you're really looking for? And sometimes you can have, you, you may want the most, the best person, the five year gold star tenant but if you keep, if you are saying that's your stand, that particular unit that you're renting to, then you need to apply that to every single person coming through that door. And you're right. Right. It may, it may disqualify that person who only had the first one had one year employment history. Also, every right. time you, and your your pool of applicants will also shrink based on what your criteria that you put forward. Right. Well, I guess my, my answer would be what I'm looking for is the best candidate. Yeah. The most employment in this scenario we're talking about. The longest history of employment. But you can't do that. So I think we're at time at this point, Alex. I, I think that I don't really want to to you know, a, a, you know, case by case situation. I just think that the question that I had was why was first in time place, and and so that was my answer. So go ahead, Alex. Thank oh, you very I, much. I think, yeah, I I think it's been a great discussion. Um, I think, um, why do you have the ability to sort of close out the participants, or should we just close the whole? I think I need to be the last person standing. Is um, let me check. I don't know if we can or not. Let me see. I yeah, don't I think I, what I'll yeah. do is I'll stop sharing my um, um, PowerPoint and, <laughs> and then I think you might have um, the ability, Alec, to, uh, as the host, to um, close out the participants. 
Okay, participants, I'm going to close you guys out. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I will um, be moving you to the lobby. <laughs> Rosalito, move to lobby and okay so there's just three of us now right yes that's what i see yeah okay that was we did it yes you did yeah. great alec mike yeah <laughs> yeah i actually you know just for feedback i think it would be helpful just to have even if it was just a short 30 minute presentation to just to kind of get the get the brain um you know get the get the moving the, well, yeah the brain move because i think that sometimes when you do these just kind of open in the qa people don't know what the questions unless you kind of prompt it you know like service animals or person time or you know because people aren't really thinking about it probably in that context because they didn't have a preface or a framework coming into this conversation but that's just a, and i think we kind of ended up there in a way right because it's sort yeah. of I, I thought, oh, I'm going to regret bringing up the roommate bill, but nobody took the bait on that. Yeah. I'm going to ask about the roommate bill, but I didn't know what to. I didn't know if you really wanted to go there because I, I know it's kind of a, uh, uh, a bit of a, a conversation. It would be a good long conversation, I think. Probably. Yeah, it kind of cr creates those nightmare scenarios, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's kind of interesting because I think like the roommate bill is very similar to like person time. It's like, okay, it's a law, but then, you know, it's like, okay, who's really going to be pushing those things and who's going to really, you know what I mean? It's just kind of one of those, you know, when do these come up? It's going to be, I think roommate bill is actually going to create more scenarios for um, inter-tenant issues that we're mm. really not. I, it, it'll be interesting. I don't think people really know about it yet, so I, I feel like yeah, it that's might true. just be, you know, it's it's not really a thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was kind of cool. I I not really a tech person, so it's kind of amazing that it all works. <laughs> it worked. You guys did great. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, you know, Alex, I did not see your PowerPoint. The yeah. <laughs> screen. So it disappeared. I just, I don't know how it disappeared or anyway, but I was, it just had a gray screen. I mean, yeah, well, okay. It was a gray screen. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of I wasn't sure if that was on my own. Yeah. I wasn't sure if that was just on my end though. But. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, I think I definitely did it right. Like I had the, to me, it was said it was sharing the whole time. Oh, wow. So it, it, it did share at the beginning and then it kind of disappeared not really sure what happened yeah oh yeah. i wonder maybe sometimes you click something you don't even know you clicked yeah. it you know yeah it's really hard to tell what you're sharing actually um as a as the sharer it's hard to tell so that's definitely <laughs> and i didn't want to mention it to you because i know you're um, a little bit frazzled with all the um, <laughs> screens that you have. So, but you know, people were fine. So I just kind of left it. It is interesting the way this um, WebEx works that the, the host has all this power, but then everything gets shrunk. Right. Like you, you share something and then suddenly I can't see anything about participants anymore though. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a little strange, but. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. stop the hey, recording, you guys... Alec? I think. Oh. Um, let me see if that's um. Let's see. I can. I, I just hope it asks to.